intuition is, as you can see, is an attempt to do a prospective of Susan's work. Although Susan's work is very difficult to deal with the prospect of sense because we will have works to use in the past that then later on we find an echo and uh, namely here in this floor we have one of the most uh, well, the best known uh, works she did in the 70s Carnival Strippers which is that essay photographic reportage over there and uh, this is the work that uh, sort of um, make her deserve the acknowledgement of the first meetings and most of the uh, magnum photos in 1976. But the exhibition starts with early work from the 70s, and it is a work that it, it's not only been the work, it was something she had learned, and then it very um, relatively acquired quality of work. And I like to say that because when we look at 44 Irving Street, this series on the left and on the right is a work that she made early on in a dorm as she was a student. So the photographs you have here are photographs that were not meant to be final copies or final prints for the um, you know, I mean, for hmm. the work for the, for the project she had to do at the school. Uh, on the contrary, these were the contact sheets that she used to get in contact with the people in the dorm. So this is kind of a, a way of understanding photography already quite substantially different than the idea of taking a photo, making an ice cream, and then making it circulate. This is the very beginning when she's attempting to kind of uh, give back image and also get back common feedback from the sitter, from the person who's being photographed. So this is a work that we have literally taken out from folders in the archive, although uh, kind of a, a bunch of these photographs already exist in the Harvard collection, Harvard University collection. This is a work that we recompose and we again present as work, even though I mean, many of the prints were lost, many of the comments have not been kept over time. So this kind of um, elusive quality as work is something that really interests me. Because then the next work, the, the, the porch portrait, which is, again, which is again a series or series of photographs made in 73 in Mississippi. Uh, what you get to see here is not the work. It's the, 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 the proof, the first prints she made out of the negatives, but then the real work are the postcards she sent back to the people who had been photographed. Of course, those photographs, those postcards are now difficult to recuperate, you know? So but from the curatorial point of view, it's interesting, or we have, let's say, the capacity to transform something that was not just simple process, but it was a deeper understanding of work in the work. So we brought it, we frame it, and I personally tried to frame it, uh, making it look like almost similar to the rest of the work leading up to Carnival Strippers in 1976. So this is the inside the story of how our work is it presented, because the photographic practice, it moves through intuitions, urges, necessities, she has mm. already said. And to relativize this work, we also have the dreams and the archives to look at the many notes, many handwritten comments that she normally uh, ends up uh, scribbling over time while she's doing projects. And I'd like to draw your attention to the huge number of letters she exchanged with the women she photographed with uh, four cardinal strippers which is kind of a pinnacle of a modern photography because it's kind of a reportage style. Uh, shortly before, she'd been assistant with um, uh, Frederick Weisman for Titicat Police. So you see that Susan is coming from this social documentary tradition, but at the same time, she's slowly becoming skeptical about the way of understanding this 
social documentary or the, the implicit ideas of justice in this type of country. So... How should we do this? Yeah. <laughs> well, because it, it, it's a limited time for all of you. You're exhausted. You've been listening all day. I listened only in the morning, so you must be exhausted. I don't know how much you want us to walk you just with a few ideas yeah. in different sections. Mm -hmm. So, Kalash, I think the other thing that in this process, when you go back 40 years, you start to think about things. One, one aspect of curatorial process is what you hear from someone outside of your process. What Kalash was just saying, and also Pia Buing, who's in the Jeux de Pomme, uh, took notice of the idea of place. So I, I want to emphasize that because here you feel place, the boundaries of place, which turn out to have a fairly consistent structure in a lot of the work I do, which I never really consciously thought I'm looking for places. But I begin in a small place, which is my own boarding house where I'm living. I go to, a, to people's homes where I don't enter because it's so private. And then the next section is about my neighborhood, girls who live on the block that I live on in New York. And when you think about girl, the girls show, it's a physical thing that moves in a truck. It's a place where many things happen. So in a way, even ending with Pandora's box, it's a place. So something about this whole floor links place and then downstairs you start to feel place is a country, is a history. So place also has a very strong role or the desire for a place, like the Kurds not having a homeland. Yeah? So I think place resonates more than we, you know, I consciously was thinking about it. And yet even the last work, A Room of Their Own, is all about the place of the rooms that I showed you and the place of the refuge, which is a way to escape and be protected. So it's kind of strange to discover a theme, a sub-theme in your work, you know, 40 plus years later. So this, these, this takes a lot of time to look at. I think we can just pass by, but discovering bits and pieces of your own process is the only reason I found it is because I never left my place. <laughs> I've lived in the same literally studio for 43 years so that explains the sediment you know you have a lot of stuff uh, this is one chapter that we haven't talked about it's i worked in a small mill town this is really the first archival project where i teach young people they go back to their families they find the photographs that were made of the generations that have stayed in this town and we do a collective exhibition in 1975 of this one town and the people, the families that stayed in this one town. The Prince Street Girls material is related to this center. And then you see Carnival Strippers. Another thing I didn't mention before, but we talked about repatriation, part of not only giving a photograph in a Polaroid, but bringing back prints, and you can see little notations. These are things that the girls, the women, liked, and I would go for a weekend. I brought them the contact sheets the next weekend of what I had photographed. They would then say, We'd like, I like this photograph, I like that photograph. So it was an intercambio, yeah, right from the beginning. I mean, this is Lena's, some of Lena's letters, which are just an example. She, when I start to prepare the book, she writes down what she thinks should be said in part of her text. This is another very strange bit. I mean, it's too much to talk about in a quick way, but the book strippers, which you see here, becomes, uh, I take all the audio, which is several, maybe, I don't know, 100 plus hours of audio, listening to the women, the managers, the clients, and transcribe it. So that's my notebook of transcription. Under cover. Sorry? You did it undercover? Not undercover, no. Just not undercover. Not like with your sneaky iPhone, no. No, no, no. <laughs> A big clunky audio recorder that looked like this, I could have put it in the case. But, uh, 
and I capture their interactions. You know, sometimes it's the manager talking to the girls, sometimes it's between the girls. I transcribe it all and that becomes the text for the book. So you hear in the first edition of the book and you can hear it on the two, you can hear a collage of those voices. The first way that Strippers was presented was not as a book, it was an exhibition where you heard the live sound, which I've always believed was the best way, but in this setting it was impossible. So at the Jeux de Palme in Paris, we'll have the original sound the way I first conceived the show. The interesting thing I was going to point to is that a young Puerto Rican playwright reads the book and wants to make a play from the text. So he creates a play from the text, which is their actual words. And Lena, this young woman, goes with me to the opening night to see herself reperformed. Yeah? three years later. It's quite a wild kind of little story. So there's stories within stories and we don't have time. This is, uh, you know, a very different, this is Lulu who was a burlesque star who did work with the carnival, extremely funny and gives me all the vocabulary of the things that relate. You know, it's how you could, the anthropology of, you know, the ethnography of the striptease world. I mean, she's telling me what it means to be, who's the bouncer, what it means to be burn out a spot or to bally or to blow off or to carny or a, et cetera. She gives me the vocabulary. So she educates me about what I'm seeing, which I don't know the history of. And then this is some of the background work for ben Pandora's box, which I know is very difficult work. Uh, I think it's surprising when you look at it, especially from afar, to realize that this work was done in 95, so 22 years ago. Um, so I enter a loft, a 10,000 square foot loft. There's also someone named Nick Broomfield who's making a film there. It's just a very seductive place. And I spend three weeks kind of immersed in this little world that's private. Um, so, you know, part of what I, I've also included is the catalog because this show was part of a show I did at the Canal d'Isabel in Madrid some years ago with Carnival Strippers and Pandora's Box. The show is called Intimate Strangers and I always thought that there was a relationship between Carnival Strippers and Pandora's Box, 20 years apart, right? So these are some of the comments that Again, you know, very often when you're in a process of doing an exhibition, you never get the feedback. You never know what people are thinking or feeling or take away. So I think that's another part of the incomplete circle artistically, you know. So this just gives hints. This is the form that the men sign when, for whatever it is they, they want done upon them. They choose the weapon, meaning the means by which and the, the intensity they want the violence upon them. So maybe I just, I don't know, Carla, should we say 10 minutes and you float around because maybe more than my speaking, you gotta choose a corner and then we'll go downstairs and so point out. Do 10 minutes counts right here. Yeah. Okay. But if you have any questions. Yeah, if you have questions, you can come, but otherwise sure, you might sure. wanna just experience something. This is uh, Nicaragua and the Susan with her uh, sort of uh, staunch, doubtful <laughs> attitude um, went back to the work and sort of exploded her own narrative, her own cultural narrative, her own historical narrative. And these walls were first exhibited in 1983, Two. 1982, 1984. In, in England, and um, for me it always has represented like the key work in Susan's career. And this is very difficult to say because I mean someone else may come and say, no, <laughs> this is the important work. For me it is really important because it acknowledges the circulation of images as part of the production of images. So even though the book has been published, he acknowledges the fact that those images are still alive, generating new meanings, or even betraying original meanings. So the interesting thing about this work is all the sequels, the critical sequels she will 
uh, actually uh, made. In 1984, she will uh, do real produce uh, voyages, kind of a film in collaboration with Mark Carlin, uh, in which their exchanges, their letters, uh, provide a voiceover commenting on every single image and always with a very doubtful attitude or a very hesitant attitude towards what the event seemed or might have been. Then in 1991, she produced with uh, Alfred Buxetti and, um, and Rick Dick uh, Rogers, yeah. Dick Rogers uh, pictures from a revolution. And then in 2004, reframing history, these murals were made for that moment for the 25th anniversary of the Sandinista revolution. So what we get in this space is like several layers. So the event, the moment, the historical moment cannot be grasped by one single image. It's like a layer of a layer. And this is what we really try to convey. I think this is one of the first times that you ever exhibit these murals next to the photographs. Well, next to mediations, yeah. yeah. Next to mediations. Yeah. And then flanking out these, you have El Salvador, which is a very straight photojournalistic work. And I say straight because it's when she feels a sense of urgency towards what she has to represent, denounce, and convey. But on the other hand, a very different sense of urgency is that wall representing the life of the revolution, the life of a fighter, and the life of the image in three different chapters. So the year installing this work this way is to provide the work with a dialogical approach. So that the work is never something completely finished, that has a sort of a permanent, stable meaning, but it's always unsettled by work done in the, in the, in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why when she started to work on Kurdistan, I really believe mm. she already knew that the, that was going to take years. And because of that, she also committed to represent not only the last recent event of the massacre, but a hundred years of history through the very history of photography itself. So. It's a very lucky thing in life to have a curator who understands yeah. you so well <laughs> and speaks so beautifully. So no, I think that's... I mean, the, the monitors are each of those uh, films, pictures from revolution, voyages, and reframing history. But of course, you can't, you don't have time to watch any of them. Um, I don't know what else we can add to that. Um, the case shows you the book that I referred to earlier, the work of 30 photographers. Um, and, you know, I think the only part of the show that I've worried about is exactly that wall and partly because of what you've all been thinking about and studying all day. This question of how you portray violence, this isn't public, like on the street, but it is public in the sense of an exhibition, where there are layers of history behind almost every one of those images. So just to give you a small corner of what leaves me unsettled or wondering what more we could do, and we did have ideas, and we should also talk about this app, um, but just to give you a quick from where we're standing, if you look at the images on the top, the last two images and the one just below it, um, this is of the El Mosote massacre, which is known to have been the largest massacre in Latin America historically. And the woman above, when we were talking about witness, she gave testimony. She was the only, one of the very few survivors, the first person to tell us about how many people had been killed in Mosote. That massacre was denied by the State Department, the U.S. State Department. And just to the right of Rufina, you see this hillside, which is the training of the Adelkat Battalion, who were the people that actually did the massacre in 1980. So what's, I think, again, that's a lar much larger story to tell. All we do is we have a representation in the case of a magazine Called about Mosote, which was the New Yorker magazine, gave the entire magazine over to the investigation. So just as an example of layers and layers, where do you begin and end? It's the biggest challenge for, for all of us. Um, the other thing, just to add to layers, and I don't know how quickly if it'll work on my phone, um, the other thing which was 
pictures of a revolution where I described earlier going back 10 years later and finding the people in some of the photographs. The other thing I did when we reprinted the book, which is now in print, the third edition, we created something called the Look and Listen app. And we did that here so that if you have a Spanish phone, the film is in, Ch in English and Spanish. And Look and Listen is a free app. And what you do is you, when you see this icon, it's not the icon like a QR code, but it's the image that right away is recognized and it cuts to, it cuts to uh, the film. Now I don't have the, enough Wi-Fi on my, my phone because I'm not registered. Do you have yours? So the idea is that the image, when you have the signal and it's in the book or in the exhibition, it right away triggers and you hear the story about the making of that photograph. So the, the idea here was that when in making a book, you're in the turning of pages, you see this icon and you go ahead in time 10 years later to what happened to the person in the photograph, right? And that we, we adapted that here for the exhibitions because it's, it's actually the image that triggers the film clip, if you follow. So I think time is a very important element of what you see throughout this whole downstairs. Time is really the sub-theme, not just place, but time. Time in a place, time going on in a place, right, over time, which you feel on the other side, Kurdistan. So maybe we should, we'll just walk you this way, because this is the wall that Karlish referred to, the violence of the bodies and the necessity, the urgency to document the bodies, and then going to Kurdistan 10 years later, not feeling you need bodies. It's the hidden bodies. So this is the first wall that, that Karlesh very strongly felt curatorially. It was important to juxtapose the killing in El Salvador and the kind of death that had been hidden, the Anfal campaign that was not known in 88 and 89 and not documented. Most of the Kurds had fled, those that survived, fled into Turkey or Iran, and I crossed the border from Iran into northern Iraq to do the work of the destroyed villages and eventually the mass graves. So you see the mass graves. And that began this idea that the digging of history would tell about the urgency of this people to to be annihilated. So what you have here is a four channel projection that really tries to give an audience a sense of how that process happened, the way I'm telling you now, parts of that. You know, I try to reconstruct a suppressed history from dispersed fragments. This is coming from the introduction of the book. So this is the book and part of what you can get a sense of, but this is an ar archive part of an archive that the Iraqi police had, the intelligence police of an execution. And as you go back this way, this is the documentation I did, the archeological drawings of the, the mass graves, the New York Times article that was published. And as we go back, we go back in time. So we keep moving back in time, the 70s, different parts of Kurdistan, the area of Turkey, which is really under assault now more than any area. Um, do you all know that the Kurds claimed their referendum a week before the Catalonia? So you're linked in history. <laughs> and anyway, going back, so these are all made by different people. This is a studio photographer in Sulaymaniyya in northern Iraq, an American photographer published, a French photographer, so I'm tracing the paths of different image makers over time. Work from Russia, different geographies, work from Tajikistan, an American ambassador who photographs, collects the photographs of the Mahabad, which is the only time the Kurds had an autonomous region. He collects the photographs in Iran. So this idea that we all have the potential to preserve, to guard, to contribute to a collective history. In English, 
uh, colonial administrator of the region. This man was sent, Major Knoll, and his was sent from the, from the British to determine the relationship between the Kurds and the Turks to, in 1919. So it was the idea of how should they, how could they live together? And of course, if you know history, you know that today they still can't live together. So the policy wasn't really um, effective. Again, colonial, um, and colonial photographs and studio photographs. And then here is a, a video that I did in the street where you see people making those very small little ID photos. So what you want is a feeling of the circle of the ID photos that end up in the pockets of the people who are found in the mass graves in the beginning. Ends with the beginning here for me of seeing a street photographer in that very primitive way making a, with a, with a camera. And this monitor collect, connects to Temor, who's one of the first testigos. You can see the bullet, the scar of the bullet. He survives a village massacre, and he ends up testifying against Saddam, which is what this monitor shares. When we were talking about pictures being held, like the Plaza de Mayo, these are some of the photographs that I made, kind of registering the importance of photographs. Um, and this whole question of memorializing. And the last wall, the story map that you see behind you, where is Carles? You just told me that you were, so here's someone who just told me that he, in 1988, 89, was in Turkey and made photographs, and I'm trying to encourage him to come and contribute a little book, because really the idea is that the stories go on, the stories of encounters with the Kurdish population from whichever area, the diaspora, living, in the various parts of, of Europe or globally, really, but we chose to only focus on Europe. Um, so each of those are contributed after through um, workshops that we've been giving. We gave a workshop, I think there were 15 stories from Barcelona now, included either under Barcelona or from the areas of that they came from in the Middle East. So it's this idea that everything is a fragment, nothing is complete. Um, and we go on, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> I went home to home. I worked a lot with different parts of the community, some scholars, some just families. I went to archives, uh, postcards, you can see different, different sources. Where? All over, all over, all over. Iran, Iraq, Turkey, all over Europe. The big archives were in uh, England, France, colonial archives, America. The colonials kept good records, as you can imagine. So some are original, you know, the studio photographer. I just bought the, a series of studio photographs that he had made. I collected the postcards uh, in, in little shops. Um, some are still on loan. And is it a project ongoing? This is the only ongoing. The story map is really ongoing. So when we go to France, I'll do another workshop in France. and. There'll be another one in, in San Francisco. And people, I'm hoping Carlos is going to contribute. Where is he? Yeah. Carla, this Carlos. He's going to contribute a story. You have to yeah, check out those little storybooks. Because his photographs are part of something that it's not in an archive. Nobody knows about them. So he has to think about what story he wants to tell. So the workshops are three or four days. People come saying, I have nothing to tell. I have no story. and then. They discover there's something very small they do want to say, and that's what this story's, the little, they make the little books. And they take the pictures. In this they take the pictures they have, or they find pictures. Yeah. Um, but it makes it a little bit more site-specific to have recent, recent stories. I mean, these are people who've come to Barcelona very recently, as of several weeks. One. Uh, actually is the story of a Spanish man who went to a refugee camp in, on the border of Turkey, David, and he met his future wife there, which he didn't expect, and she's now living here. It was a beautiful moment that they shared from the two perspectives their story. So you never know what you find when you open up the question of stories, to share a story. 
was difficult for these people to, to live a part of their private history? Well, you know, like, like a yeah, story. you know, I think uh, in some cases I reproduce photographs. I never, I didn't take original photographs. Okay. And in some cases, like a community studio archive, he's in the business of selling it's photographs. Not so it's not, well, it's private, but it's understood part of what he does. So there he is. <laughs> I was struck by the role of the local photographer's keeper of the collective archive, which is what we're just talking about. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, yeah, 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 yeah.